the sermon text for today is Colossians chapter 1. When you came in, you may have gotten a little card with that text on it. Uh, since we don't have pew Bibles for you to turn to, that will work today to follow along um, with our text. Colossians chapter 1, beginning of verse 24. I'll read down to verse 3 of chapter 2. Colossians 1, 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, this is your word. We are your people. And so we ask now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would exalt your Son. Make us to see him this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you might recall the place in 2 Peter chapter 3 when the Apostle Peter um, makes this comment about the Apostle Paul. Okay, uh, so, so Peter, uh, he, he, make, he, he says in there, he, he talks about Paul and says that Paul, he's written some letters, and this is what he says. He says, um, um, our beloved brother Paul, bless his heart, um, there are some things in the letters that he's written that are hard to understand. Okay, that's 2 Peter 3.16. So the Apostle Peter is talking about the Apostle Paul, and he says that some of Paul's letters are not easy reads. Okay, Now, you might recall that place in 2 Peter. It's a fascinating part of Scripture. You may recall that. Maybe you don't. But you need to know this morning that when Peter says that Paul's letters are hard to understand, he is not talking about the book of Colossians. Okay. The reason I say that is because this letter, Colossians, is one of the clearest, maybe the clearest letters in the New Testament. Paul writes and very straightforward. He says, this is what I do. This is the goal of what I do. And this is why I do what I do. That's the letter straightforward. He says these things explicitly. And then the whole letter is Paul kind of like working out how that actually looks. And I think we can learn from him. I think we must, we should learn from him. As a church, especially a, a, a new church, it's important for us to know um, what it is that we're doing here, right? What, what, are, we, what are we up to? What, what is this about? Well, following Paul's example, um, I want to just say three things to answer that question. First, our work, our goal, and our reason. Our work, our goal, our reason. As, as we look at these, I want us to put them together and let, it, and let it begin to shape the culture of our church. And I say that because um, what we're going to look at really is for everyone in our church. Don't, I mean, this is not you know, this, this work and goal and reason. This is not just for the pastors. It's not just for the leader types. Um, this really is for everyone Everyone in our church. And so if you're here this morning as a guest, um, no, I'm, we're so glad that you joined us. Um, it, it is our blessing to have you here. Thank you. If, if you're a Christian, please pray for us toward this. Please pray that, that um, this will become who we are as City Church. If you're here and you really are just checking things out, then hopefully uh, this sermon will be like a little snapshot of what it is we're trying to do. So, so there we go. Our, our work, our goal, 
and then our reason. The first thing to look at is our work. That's Colossians 1.28. I mean, this is just so straightforward. Beginning in verse 28, speaking about Jesus, Paul says, him we proclaim. Him I proclaim. Him we proclaim as a church. Paul, Paul explains just before that in verse 27 what it is that God has called him to do. Paul is called to make known, to show people that the riches of God's glory in Christ is great among the nations, which means the good news of Jesus is for everybody everywhere, and that good news, the truth that was once veiled but is now clear, that's this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is, this is how that goes, okay? Just, just be really clear. This is, this is how that goes. Jesus the Messiah is Lord of all. He's king of the universe. He's savior of the world. And when you put your faith in Jesus, when you trust him and embrace him in his death and resurrection, you then become united to Jesus. His spirit becomes a part of you. And you're so joined to Jesus. You're so connected to Jesus that all the benefits of Jesus as the son of God become your benefits. It means you're forgiven for all your sins. It means you're declared righteous and guiltless before God. It means you're cleansed from any defilements. It means you're made a son or a daughter of God with a future. It means you, you have the hope of glory. You'll be with God forever. This is what Jesus is about. This is what Jesus came to do. And when Paul says that he proclaims Jesus, Paul is saying that this is what I'm about. This is what I do. I tell this good news. And so if that's what but Jesus was about and what Paul's about, I think that's what we should be about. This should, this should be our work. We should proclaim Christ. Now, don't get the wrong impression, though. To say that, that, that Paul, for him to say he proclaims Christ, for us to say that our work is to proclaim Christ, it doesn't mean that we, you know, we walk around and we just, we just shout Jesus at people. Okay? We, we don't, it's not, you know, we go to our neighbors and it's just, Jesus, you know. Um, don't try that at home or at work or anywhere. Um, that's not exactly what Paul has in mind. If, if, you, if you actually look down um, in verses 2 and 3 in chapter 2, I have it included on that, on that paper. This is what Paul says about Jesus. He says that in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So the implications here are this. When we proclaim Jesus... We're not just dropping his name. When we proclaim Jesus, we are talking about ultimate reality. Paul, Paul actually explains what that looks like at the end of verse 28. He says, him we proclaim, and then he follows with a short phrase, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom. Now, the word here for warning. It's also translated admonish in the New Testament. In the original language, the word, it means literally to put in mind. It's the idea of putting your mind in order. Um, it really explains the negative side of Paul's ministry when Paul is needing to, to fix things or to organize complexity or, or to clear things up. That, that's, that's, I think, what it means to warn or admonish. It's, it's to basically clear things up. And that's what we need in our lives. We, we need things cleared up. Now, I know, I know what you're probably, I know what we're thinking here. Some of us, we hear the word warning, you know, warning and teaching, and we're like, you know, I don't need, I don't need warning. Uh, maybe the, the, I know people who do need warning, but I want the teaching. I don't need the warning. I want the teaching. But see, um, that, that's not actually how it works in the text. That's not, um, that's not what Paul is doing. Paul's work involves both warning and teaching. It's not like there's a warning part of, of gospel ministry that's for the really messed up people, and then there's the teaching part of gospel ministry that's for the people who want to just grow and mature. That's not how it goes. This is not milk and meat. This is warning and and teaching is for everybody because we all, somewhere in our lives, have things messed up and we need to have those things put in order. So it's not just for one type of person, it's for everybody. It's not even just a one-time one thing. It's a thing that's happening all the time. Paul uses the same word in Acts 20, verse 31. Paul uh, is explaining, his, he's, he's going to be leaving the Ephesians. He's been with them for years, and he's explaining to them um, what he's done, what his ministry has been like. This is what he says. He says, he uses the same word here for warning. He says, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day 
to admonish everyone in tears. Same word. Night and day for three years, Paul was warning the Ephesians over and over again. Paul helped the churches put things in order. He helped the churches clear things up when it came to the glory of Jesus and how he changes everything. He actually does it in this letter as well. He models for us in chapter 2 what it means to be warned, to put things in order. And then verbatim, in Colossians 3, verse 16, you should have it on that card. Paul uses the same phrase there as he does in verse 28. Look at chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing or warning one another in all wisdom. So Paul proclaiming Christ and the church having the word of Christ dwell in us richly looks the same way. We're teaching, we're warning one another with all wisdom. This is our word, this is what we do. We help one another as a church, as a community, understand Jesus. We help one another understand how Jesus changes lives. I, I want us to think of this as just the normal part of our life together. Don't think there has to be some formal procedure for how this goes. This is just everyday life together as a church. We're warning and we're teaching, we're admonishing, we're helping one another as a church understand who Jesus is and what he's done. We speak Jesus to one another. Is that, that's how we can, we can say it that way. We speak Jesus to one another. But there's more. There's the goal of why we do that. Why do we speak about Jesus all the while? Why are we always talking about Jesus? Well, the, the goal is what he says there in the latter part of, of verse 28. The goal for proclaiming Christ is that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now, the word here for mature could also be complete. It just means that the goal for everyone who comes into the sphere of our ministry is that they be grown up in Christ. They be whole in Christ, mature in Christ. Paul actually, he shows us what that looks like in the rest of the letter. If you were to continue reading in Colossians, you would see um, just a few verses later, you have it right there, verses 2 and 3. Um, he says that his struggle for the church is that we reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Okay, So to, to be to mature in Christ is to really know Christ. Or we could say to be mature in Christ, Paul might say, is to walk in Christ, to be rooted and built up in Christ, established in the faith. That's chapter 2, verse 6. Or we might say to be mature in Christ is to set our minds on Christ. To find our identity in Jesus in whom our lives are hidden. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. Or we might say to be mature in Christ is to look like Jesus in our character. Chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Or maybe it's we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. 3.15. Or the word of Jesus dwell in us richly. 3.16. To be mature in Christ, Paul might say, is to let Everything that we do, whatever we do in word or in deed, be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. These are the ways that Paul exhorts the church in this letter. This is the way he envisions them, who he envisions them to become. This is what it means to be mature, complete, grown up. I think it's helpful for us to clarify our mission. We talked about our mission straight from the mouth of Jesus. Matthew 28 is to make disciples. We want to make disciples. Jesus said to do that. We want to do that. But then we got to, Paul helps us qualify that a little bit more. What kind of disciple are we trying to make? Well, we said, okay, disciples are worshipers, servants, and missionaries. So we want to make disciples like Jesus said. Disciples worship Jesus. Disciples serve like Jesus. Disciples are missionaries with Jesus. But, but we need to qualify this a little bit more and say, okay, look, we don't want to just be a disciple, a worshiper, servant, and a missionary in theory. We don't want to just hear that and say, sounds good. Nor do we want to be a disciple by just doing different things. We're not going to become a mature disciple of Jesus. We're not going to become a disciple like what Paul wants for us if we just incorporate events in our lives. It's not, you know, filling up our calendar with stuff to do is not going to make us mature in Christ. The goal is not how we think or what we do. It's about us having an all-consuming embrace of Jesus. Or we might say, it's about Jesus having an all-consuming embrace of us. We don't want to be disciples 
We don't want to be followers of Jesus, worshipers, servants, and missionaries merely on paper. We, we want that to be the case absolutely, totally. We want our lives to be overcome by him. We want the end of ourselves. We want more of Christ, more of Christ in our lives, in our church. We really want to be what Paul says in chapter 3, that everything we do, whether word or deed, we do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That's our goal for ourselves. That's our goal for those who um, are in the sphere of our ministry as a church in this city. Paul's saying something else here, too. You may notice this in the text. Um, he repeats the word all. We say everyone, um, but actually in the original, it's the exact same word said four times in a row. Okay, If we're following it, how, how the repetition looks literally, Paul is saying in verse 28, Christ we proclaim warning all men and teaching all men in all wisdom that we may present all men mature in Christ. So all, 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 four times in a row, that's a clue that is probably important. Like Paul's trying to emphasize this, which means the work and the goal, proclaiming Christ, everyone mature in Christ, really goes for everyone, everybody. And what that does, this is important, what that does, it actually says more about God's grace than it does our own ministry. God's miracle working grace in Jesus, his saving us and making us like Jesus is so great, so expansive, so overflowing that it is for every single kind of person in our city and on the face of the earth. It's for everyone. And what that means for us, I think what we need to hear is that if that's the case, if that grace is so expensive and so great and it's for everyone, it means there is no one outside the possibility of that miracle happening in their lives. Do you understand that? If God's grace is that great, if proclaiming Christ and, and the goal is that everyone be mature in Christ, if his grace is great enough for that, it means that no one no one is outside the possibility of that happening in their lives. What this does is this actually corrects our, our little messed up perceptions of how God works in the world and in our city. See, what we do, as a, what, we, what we tend to do is we tend to look at certain people and gravitate towards certain people and think, yeah, that person right there, they, they really have potential to be a mature Christian. Man, they really have potential to be a leader. Man, they really have potential to be grown up in Christ. And while we're sitting here doing that, while we're thinking that way, one of the next pastors of City's Church is selling cocaine down Lake Street right now. See, as we're looking at people and, and we're trying to make our judgments and think, yeah, that person's got promise. One of the ladies who's gonna be your most faithful prayer partner a few years from now, she's wearing a burqa right now. You can only see her eyes, see? Right now, this moment, that's where she's at. What we're doing here, this, this Christ that we proclaim, this goal of everyone being mature in him, is for every kind of person because God's grace is that great. Our, our work to proclaim, pro, proclaim Christ, our goal that all be mature in Christ it's for everyone. That's what Paul said. That's what we say. And we should know that this can be our work. This can be our goal only because it was God's work and goal first. That's our last point. It's our work. It's our goal now, the reason. Why, why are we doing this? What is, what is this about? Paul starts the letter this way. This is all of chapter one. Paul gives a rationale for why he's doing what he does. We should never forget that this amazing thing we get to do, this, this exalting Jesus, is lifting him high, and drawing people to him. This is the work that we are invited into. It's not a work that we invented ourselves. Everything around us, creation, everything in it exists because God the Father chose to show us his glory, which means God has shown us Jesus. In a phrase, we, we get to do what we do here. We, we get to do this work and have this goal because Jesus is real. You guys have heard me say that so many times, but I really do think that we don't, we don't get that. Like Jesus is real. He, he is so real. 
Paul grounds the whole letter of Colossians in that one fact. If, if we want to see it, just look in chapter 1. The point here in the apostle's mind, hopefully ours, and this is important, is that any talk or, or efforts, any of our work or our goals when it comes to mission is inconceivable apart from the reality, the glory of Jesus. What we need, and so often what we will need so many times, is not going to be a better strategy or a better method. What we're going to need is just to see him. That's what we're going to need, just to see him, to be reminded that Jesus is real. As a church, there's so much ahead of us. There's so much we want to do. There's so much we're dreaming about and wanting to do. And we should remember that this is not our burden. This is our miracle. This is our miracle. This is what God has done and what he's invited us into. Which means we should remember. Remember that, that we, that, that, that you, church, were once in darkness. But God delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. This one in whom we trust, this one in whom we've been united by faith. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. For in him, in Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things that were created were created for Jesus. That means everything right now, everything in this room, everything in this universe that is exists because of Jesus. Everything that we see, everything around us is about him in reference to him, pointing to him. And he's in the room right now. He's the head of the body that is his church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The old creation and the new creation, the past, the present, the future, Jesus is king. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So this Jesus, who is behind everything and who rules everything, know this. He died for you. He bled to bring you peace, not just theoretical peace. He died to bring you real peace. He died in your place on the cross. He suffered the punishment we all deserve for our sins, no matter what they are, no matter what our past may be. Jesus took it, and in exchange, he gives us his righteousness this morning. He gives us his righteousness. He gives you and me a perfect standing before God. He died and was buried and was raised victorious over death to bring us home, to make us his. To make us no longer estranged from God the Father, but now his son or his daughter. And this is why we do what we do. This is why we do it. This is the reason why we have this word. This is the reason why we have this goal. We didn't invent this. We didn't come up with this. This is something that God has done and that God has invited us into. And I want, do, you, do you believe that? Do you believe that this morning? If, if you're here and you've never embraced Jesus that way, you can do it right now. Just trust him right now. Trust Jesus that way. He died for you. Church, this morning, we have a mission. We, we have this thing that God has called us into. Embrace Jesus now. Embrace what he has done. Embrace this thing that he has let us be a part of. Our work and our goal. It's not our burden. It's our miracle. If we put it all together, we might say it this way. What we're invited to do as a church, we speak Jesus to know Jesus because of Jesus. That's the phrase. That's, that's, that's if you hear our work, our goal, and our reason all put together. We speak Jesus to know Jesus because of Jesus. Our work to proclaim, proclaim Christ, our goal to be complete in Christ, and our reason because of who Christ is, is what I pray, what I dream becomes true of City's church. We speak Jesus to know Jesus because of Jesus. This is his invitation. This is what he is saying to us. 
And of course, he also says, I'll be with you forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we need you to move by your spirit and help us to be blown away by, by this fact that you have invited us into this thing, into this amazing privilege of proclaiming you, proclaiming the good news of who you are and what you've done. Would you make that truth, that reality, wash over our souls? Would you blow our minds away by this amazing fact? We get to work with you in this. We get to be part of this thing because you, oh God, have done it. Be glorified, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.